we're real privileged today to have with us uh, Thomas uh, Waitman. Uh, Thomas E. Waitman uh, was a Pasco County Supervisor of Schools between 73 and 96. And he was a coach and teacher and assistant principal at Gulf High School. I hear several stories about <laughs> all of this here. But all of these points, uh, it's real good. Glad I didn't have to be under him. <laughs> um, he, he was a principal of Gulf uh, uh, Junior High School. He also quarterbacked the football team at Pasco High School in his junior and senior years. Quite an accomplishment there, too. And Thomas E. Waitman Middle School in Wesley Chapel is named for him. So help me welcome to the West Pasco Historical Society, Mr. Thomas E. Waitman. Thank you. Well, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and as I've said to some of you, uh, you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little rusty, because I retired twice. Uh, the first time was in 96 from the school district, and the second time was uh, in 2002 from the Florida Association of District School Superintendents. So, uh, and I don't believe I've made a formal talk uh, since 2002. So, I'm also 83 years old, and you know, as, as some of you can relate, your memory gets a little uh, cloudy at times. But nevertheless, uh, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, Gene and I, uh, first of all, we brought some breadsticks uh, from, from Bate City. And uh, I think that's one of the things that Bate City is famous for. And the reason I bought them is I thought if I don't do such a good job, if you have a breadstick, you'll say, well, you will. <laughs> So uh, when I was a kid, there was a bakery on, Main, on Meridian in Bate City. And uh, it was Tipton's Bakery. My mother was a school teacher. She taught second grade uh, for years. As in fact, that's the only grade she taught. And uh, she admittedly uh, wasn't a very good cook or baker. And uh, she would always stop at Tipton's uh, Bakery and uh, buy breadsticks, which I loved, and she'd bring them home. So. I, th I thought on this occasion I'd bring breadsticks. The, the, it's the same recipe they had 50 or 60 years ago, and they look exactly the same as I remember as a kid. And now if you ever go to Dade City, you can get them at Olga's Bakery. <laughs> so, uh, Jean, and my wife, has uh, some signs around our house. Uh, she, she changes them once in a while, but I'd just like to read some of them to you because they kind of fit in with my philosophy of, of life and, and philosophy of uh, being on the job. And these are just some of them. Happiness is a choice. Good things come to those who hustle. The heart that loves is forever young. Always, and, and this one is in, in my walk-in closet in the bedroom. Always kiss me before good night. <laughs> and another one is reach for the stars. And the, my favorite one is, is this. What you are in life is by God. And what you become is your gift to God. So uh, I think all my life I've tried to do uh, my best at whatever endeavor uh, was involved in whatever uh, job or position that I held. I believe uh, when you accept a, a position in education, whether it's administration or teaching, or an assistant, like working in the cafeteria or being a, a plant manager or uh, in a custodial position, you owe it to the people who employ you and who you serve, kids and, and parents and everybody, to
to do the best job that, that you're able to do. And uh, I, I've, it's already been said some of the things I've done, but I, I'd just like to mention these. And then uh, as, as I go through this, I'll, I'll try to put in context how uh, that relates to uh, the community and the history of this area. I, I don't feel like Methuselah, but I've been around a long time. <laughs> uh, I, I started out as a, uh, a, a teacher, and uh, that was down in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida. I, I graduated from Florida State University, and I first uh, started uh, uh, well, well I'll, I'll tell you from high school, and I moved to Dade City, and Ken has put some uh, things up for me uh, so that I can click on them, and it relates so you have some visual uh, idea of some of these. This, this one that's up here, the very first one, uh, these kids uh, that are shown here, that, that is not a regular class. Those, those are children of of uh, school teachers, and uh, that w that was a campaign uh, for superintendent uh, when I was running for office. I, it was either the first or second. I, I, I ran for office uh, six times, <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate two of those times. I think one I had a write-in candidate, and another time I didn't have anybody to run against me. So, and those are always very hectic times because. You know, as a superintendent of schools, in most areas of the United States, they are appointed by the school board. An advantage of that is that your selection for a school superintendent can be uh, nationwide. You can find the best person uh, that, that you want to have. When they're elected superintendents, you're, you're confined to the boundaries of the county. So. Uh, and, and, and sometimes the selection you make uh, may not turn out to be as good as you thought it would. And uh, so anyway, uh, I, I went through six elections, as I said. And the thing about being in elected office, you can be doing the best job uh, that you think you can possibly do, and you can still lose. And at that time, you know at the end of that election, if the results are negative for you, you got to look for another job. You, you have to go somewhere else. So, and, and so it's always a very trying time, and I experienced that a number of times uh, uh, during my career. Uh, to start out, uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and uh, I, I say I grew up, I think I was about 11 or 12 years old when my family moved to Dade City. And my father, uh, this was a little uh, village south of Pittsburgh. It was, it was uh, I'm sure you never heard of it, the name of it was Felsburg. Probably had about 500 people. And uh, so my father, and I think this is on here. There you go. Uh, and I may have to get Ken to come up here and do this for me. Uh, the reason this, this fellow is on here, his name is uh, Walter Sickles. And Walter Sickles was the uh, superintendent of schools in Hillsborough County for a, a number of years. He, he had been a superintendent in, in uh, Gainesville in uh, Alachua County. And then uh, he had been an assistant superintendent in Hillsborough County. So when uh, Ray Sheldon, who had been a longtime superintendent there, retired. The school board uh, picked Walter to be their superintendent. And the reason I have his picture up there is that he and I both came from Felsburg, a oh, oh, little time oh, really? 500 people. <laughs> yeah. And I, I thought that, that that was a, a rarity, you know, but he, he was a really fine, fine, fine man. And I went to uh, Lebanon School in Pennsylvania, and uh, 
my mother taught uh, at another school about three miles away. It was uh, Fel uh, Lebanon, and this is Lebanon in uh, Felsberg, and she taught at Webster Elementary, which was about two miles away, away from there. And that school has since been torn down. Uh, my father worked at, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, my father worked at Westinghouse, which was uh, in uh, a little section of Pittsburgh called East Liberty. And he worked on uh, components for uh, World War II submarines. And uh, at, in 1946, uh, Westinghouse, they, they no longer, you know, they had improved the type of submarines they had. And, and anyway, Westinghouse uh, closed that division and they laid off everybody who was there. My father was an electrician. And uh, so my mother was teaching school and it was in the first part of the year. And I think I was in about the sixth grade. So he used to come uh, to Florida with a friend of his who owned an orange group in, in just south of Dade City. Uh, it was on Clinton Avenue. Today that road is paved, but back then uh, it, it was a dirt road and Mr. Summey had an orange grove. And living in Pennsylvania, he had a caretaker for the grove. And the caretaker was a, a fellow named Sam Slough who, who managed uh, groves for people. And my father used to come down uh, to Dade City uh, with Earl Summey uh, when he was checking on his grove. And he, he came down probably three or four times uh, over the years. And so when he got laid off at Westinghouse, uh, he said to my mother, I think I'll go to Dade City and see if I can find work there. So my mother and I stayed and finished the school year. And he came on down and uh, he bought uh, land for a house and everything. And he, uh, see if this is here. Uh, this, is, this is the train. Dade City used to have uh, two uh, rail lines. One was the Atlantic Coast and the other was the Seaboard uh, Railroad line. And I'm not sure whether this is the Atlantic Coast or the Seaboard because one is on this end of town, the Dade City, and the other was on the, the other end. But anyway, on, on the way uh, south, uh, I, I can tell you that, that our social environment and geography and everything else has changed on that trip to Dade City. Because I can remember looking out the window and sitting in a chair with my mother in the cotton fields in South Carolina and Georgia and the number of black people that were picking cotton on the way. And, you know, you, you, don't, you don't see that anymore. They have machines that do all that and so forth. This is uh, Dade City Grammar School and this is where uh, I went to school when I came to Dade City. And <clears throat> you can tell by the architecture that in a lot of communities around the United States that it, it, it was similar architecture. And the reason for that is that this was a WPA project. It, it started after the uh, Great Depression when Franklin Roosevelt was trying to get uh, get jobs for people, so they start as the, the initials WPA stands for Work Progress Administration, and that was part of uh, Roosevelt's, excuse me. So, and, and the thing I, I remember about that when I went to school and coming from Pennsylvania, uh, kids came to school, some of the kids came barefoot, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't know if they didn't have shoes, but they just enjoyed uh, going to school with their bare feet, you know. So anyway. And the other thing about it, the, the uh, schools were still segregated. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, so there were two, two uh, black schools in Dade City. One was called Moore Academy, and the other was uh, Mickens, uh, Mickens High School. And it was traditional back then that the school was generally named after the school principal. 
And in this uh, case, uh, this, this is where I went to school, my mother taught. She taught in the second room on the, on the left there. And I remember when I was my first day of school there, uh, I didn't know anybody. And I remember, and, and this was embedded in my life, uh, I went down, there was a bathroom, a gang bathroom at the end of the hall. And <clears throat> when I went there, I walked in there and the kids were having a water fight, the boys, and they <laughs> grabbed a the water and threw it. And the principal, his name was Doc Cripe. I don't know, that's what they called him. I don't know what his formal name was. <laughs> but he walked in there and he saw that going on and I'm standing there by the door and I was the first one he grabbed hold of. <laughs> got, me by the, got me by the ear and he marched me down to my mother's room and he sit, opened the door and said, do you know what your son's doing? And I didn't say anything, you know, she said, Tom, we'll talk about this when we get home. <laughs> and I just said, Mom, I, I didn't do anything. And so, so anyway, but <laughs> the service station, I don't know if I, that's been up there yet. Well, this is my mother, uh, and, and uh, uh, she taught there for over 20 years. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you could teach school with two years of education. They called them normal schools. And uh, so she had a two-year degree when she came here. Well, in 1947, the uh, legislature uh, uh, passed a law that, that was called the Minimum Foundation Program. And it required all school teachers to have a four-year degree. So she either had to go back to school to get, that, get the BS degree or uh, find something else to do. So she went to Florida Southern College in Lakeland and uh, got, got her degree. Uh, and she, she taught second grade uh, for all those years. This was my dad's uh, service station in uh, Bay City. Now uh, there's a building there and it's a restaurant. And right across the road was uh, uh, Jernigan Ford, a Ford dealership. And just down the road was uh, a trailer park, which has since gone and the government center is, is built in that place now. But I used to, as a kid, I used to work there pumping gas. There wasn't any self-service at that time. You know, and, uh, <clears throat> You could see all the bottles and stuff. He, he sold bread and milk. It was kind of pre-7-11 yeah. days. <laughs> is that you? No, that isn't. That was, that was uh, an, uh, a cousin of mine. It was uh, my wife's brother's uh, son. And they had moved to California. The other thing about this, uh, the, the courthouse is right on the other side of this building. And the other thing, uh, I told you the schools were still segregated at that time and everything, but in the courthouse when you walk across the street, uh, the water fountains, uh, they would say colored mm -hmm. and white. And if you went into a bathroom, it was colored and white. Mm -hmm. And it seems so ridiculous now, but that, that was the way things were uh, at, at that particular time. And the one uh, movie theater they had in Date City, uh, whites were downstairs and the blacks were in the balcony and and so uh that's that's just an aside so the first uh, this brings me to newport ritchie i've talked a lot about date city but uh years ago now we have the blight on orange trees and uh the uh, citrus business has practically gone out uh, uh, at least uh, north of uh, I-4. and But this was in the heyday of Pasco Packing Company, which was the largest employer in Dade City. Practically everybody worked there. And they, they, uh, they shipped fresh fruit, but they also shipped uh, orange concentrate. They made uh, concentrate there. And uh, the, uh, I, when, I, when I was in, just out of high school and, and went to college, um, I, I would work there in the summertime, and uh, they, they have these forklifts, and you know they break these pallets that the forklift goes in and raises up. They would break those all the time, so they constantly had to make them. So I had a job, a fellow named uh, uh, 
well, it's, his last name is not important, but he, he and I uh, also was a, a college student. We built those uh, floats. And uh, the boards were already cut, so you just had to get them. And, and he worked on one side of the table and I worked on the other. And there were two fellows that they employed full time making these floats. And we, would, we, we had to make a hundred a day. And that was an effort for us, you know, we'd take a nail and be and like that. And those, those fellows that worked there and did that all day long, they would line up all the heads in their hand. And it was like a machine. They get bam, poop, bam, right, poop, right. bam. And sit around and smoke cigarettes for 15 minutes. <laughs> right there. So, the, the other thing about Pasco was that uh, when they were making concentrate, that smell you could all over town. It was a nice smell, and you got you got used to it. With, but it was the oranges being cooked. And uh, the other thing I learned there, the second summer I was there. Uh, orange groves, the, the sugar content is, varies from grove to grove. It's not all the same. So say they want to get it at 50% and bring the two together, they would take a, uh, an orange grove, uh, fruit from that grove that the citrus was, <coughs> excuse me, not up to where it should be, and the one may be too high. So they had what they called the concentrate cutback room, and it'd be in 50 gallon drums. And I had a job of helping to blend the two together so it would come out like they wanted. Mm -hmm. They also had a lab labeling room there. And uh, I remember they had, uh, they sold Donald Duck orange juice and it didn't sell. So they brought it back in and, and their main label uh, for Pasco was Old South. So they put Old South labels and sent it back out. And if you bought enough citrus from them, citrus juice, uh, they'd put your label on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my, my, my father, he loved baseball. And back then, TV was just starting. There was very little. So, so you had big crowds because they weren't watching TV. They were coming to live sporting events. And uh, he was the manager of Dade City's uh, town team. And a lot of times around, I remember Inverness had a team, Crystal River, Zephyr Hills, Newport Ritchie. Well, I came uh, to Newport Ritchie for my first time with, with the Pasco Packers baseball team, oh. which was sponsored by the plant. You know, they bought the uniforms yes. and the bats and the balls and so forth. And I remember, let's see if I have it here. Well, that's uh, Grand Boulevard in Newport Ritchie. I, I saw that for the first time. I thought it was beautiful. And we came in that way today. And I, I, it's as beautiful as ever. I, I love that scenery. And this, this is uh, where the baseball field was. And that was my first introduction to Newport Ritchie. And you see the Hacienda Hotel yeah, over on the right. The whole, yeah. And the baseball field was up here in the corner. And this has all changed, as you oh, all yeah. know now. But home plate was here, and they hit out. There was a strip along uh, Main Street, and sometimes the ball would carry over in there. And I can remember them running, or sometimes it would be a foul ball that may go in Orange Lake or something. You know. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, that was that was my first introduction and first time I'd ever seen Newport Ritchie. This is uh, Johnny Clements, and the reason I have him up here. Uh, Johnny uh, was a pitcher on the Pasco Packers baseball team. He was also uh, the uh, uh, coach of a number of sports at Zephyrhills High School, and he was the athletic director at Zephyrhills High School. Well, <coughs> Johnny pitched for the Philadelphia Phillies at one time, and he was an outstanding pitcher, and he could really throw it hard. And I was about 12 or 13 years old with the team, and just going with him to watch him. And my dad would throw me a catcher's mitt and say, catch him to warm up before the game. And I didn't act like it, but I scared to death because he threw about 90 miles an hour. Oh, no. And my hand would be swollen, you know, oh, and yeah. all that. And this was the old Pasco High School uh, where I went to school. The school board tore that down and put a beautiful uh, school in its place and it's more modern and of course it has a lot more facilities around it and, and 
the kind of white building over on the side, that, that was torn down. That was a, a really an ancient building back when, when I was in, in school there. Uh, I played uh, four, uh, four sports at Pasco. I played football, basketball, baseball, and track. And the coach at uh, Pasco at the time was this Happy Clark, who also was a school yeah. principal in, in Pasco County. In fact, when the old uh, high school was uh, part of the junior high, it was the seventh and eighth grade in there, and, and they, everybody called him Hap. Hap was the principal there. Well, before that, he was the football coach at Pasco, and I had, uh, uh, there were three of us received football scholarships to Stetson University. And it was a fellow named Joe Geiger, who, who uh, uh, was a very bright and, and an artist. And uh, Joe just passed away recently. And uh, another fellow named Jeff Blitch and, uh, and, and me. And uh, when Hap Clark was the principal, he asked me to help him with, uh, I won't go into a number of football, but he asked me to help with the team uh, in the backfield, and, and I did. And the principal of the high school at the time was a fellow named O.S. Bandy. And so before football practice was started Stetson, I, I would uh, uh, go and help them. And so uh, Dr. Bandy uh, knew of, of me doing that. So when the coach uh, vacancy opened at Pasco High, he came to Florida State before I, grad I was graduating that year. And he asked me if I would be the football coach, the head football coach at Pasco High. And I was all enthused about that. But when I got to Date City, the, one of the, uh, the main bosses at the packing company and a lot of the boosters, uh, they had already set their mind on a fellow named Joe Caruso. And uh, I was young and inexperienced. And uh, so, uh, and they said, we'd like you to stay as an assistant coach. Well, I said, I, I don't care to do that. And my high school coach had al already offered me an a, a assistant coaching position at Pompano Beach, Florida. It's down near Fort Lauderdale. So I went down there for four years and uh, enjoyed the experience. And in fact, my oldest daughter, Becky, was born at Holy Cross Hospital there. Uh, I mean, Tommy. <laughs> and uh, so... I, I came back to uh, Dade City, and Chester Taylor was the principal, and I mean the superintendent, and uh, Tommy Gibbs uh, was the principal of Gulf High School. And I can remember sitting in Chester Taylor's kitchen, and he called Tommy on the phone. He said, I got this young man here that needs a job. He said, do you have a teaching position open? And I, I had told him at the time I preferred to go to Newport Ritchie rather than to stay in Dade City. I thought, that would be better for me because there wasn't that much separation in ages of the kids. So that's what I did. I came to Newport Ritchie in uh, 1961. And uh, I taught uh, a number of social studies classes. I think I taught dry red. Any, anything that he didn't have filled, he, he, he gave <laughs> away. So I was doing a lot of different things at, at that time. and. Uh, So, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I also don't want to take up too much of your time. Let me see what the next... Anyway, this was, this was uh, Pasco High baseball team. That's picture me right here. I was, uh, and, and I enjoyed that. And Ted Williams, who used to be the uh, property appraiser, that's him in the middle, in the back. <laughs> and Jim Valentine. If you, if you go to uh, River Ridge High School, the athletic complex is the Jim Valentine complex. Well, uh, Jim uh, came later and was the athletic director for the county. And uh, he helped uh, work with the architects in, in developing and positioning the football field and track and all, all those athletic facilities. Curtis Law was a, a county commissioner. Uh, he just recently uh, passed away. He lived in Land, Land of Lakes, but he was on the county commission for a number of years, and his family had orange groves. Uh, <clears throat> so, 
in the summertime, I guess second person. And that's Pasco. I can't put put that on there. That's uh, <laughs> I'll pass that. <laughs> <laughs> this was at uh, Stetson University, and I'm, I'm the last one in the back row on the right. Oh, yeah. And and that was when I was at Deerfield Beach. That was a portable classroom because they were so crowded down there. It grew much faster at the time. And I remember sitting in, in that portable crash classroom with the door open because we just had portable air conditions yeah. in those things. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of my teacher friends came by and saw me grading papers there. It was on Saturday morning. And he said, how much are they paying you to do that on Saturday? You know, so, uh, but I, I did whatever I had to do to get, get through it. And there's Tommy Gibbs and Hap Clark who were... Uh, Gulf High administrators. Yeah. Tommy was a, 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 a nice man. And so was Hat. This is the old Gulf High building uh, <laughs> down there. It's now the uh, Schwetman Center. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Harry in a minute. But uh, <clears throat> we, when I was uh, named uh, head football coach the second year I was there, Actually, uh, before that, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, the first year I was there was a fellow named Jim Baines, who was a basketball coach, and he left to go to Orlando. So Roscoe Durden was the principal, and he said, "Would you take the basketball program?" So I did, and uh, I was fortunate to have people like um, Mike Park and and uh, a lot of others that. Uh, were, were very good athletes, and that year we practiced on it. We didn't have a gym, so we practiced on a cement court here in, in uh, Sims Park. And uh, I, I remember uh, in the wintertime that I'd say wear a sock hat. We used rubber balls because lead balls would get all torn up. And uh, you walk down by, it was right by the river, and we'd walk down to the seawall and there were schools of mullet. They would turn and face the incoming tide, and it looked like you could just walk across them. I don't know if you still have mullet today that, that uh, do that or not. But we were, we were very successful. I, I think Mike had, in his three-year career, he, he scored over 1,000 points uh, uh, in his three-year career at, at the high school. Uh, in basketball, and another fellow, Jerry Dodd, I think was close to him. Uh, but we we played on outdoor court, and, and so we used rubber balls, and we were fortunate we won the the uh, uh, conference championship. And then when I went to a meeting for the district, if you win a conference, you went to the district, and the other coaches there they would be arguing about whether we should use a Spalding 100 basketball or a Rawlings RLO basketball. And I'd say, just so it's round. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we won 21 games that year and lost four. And we went to the state tournament and uh, we lost to Apopka, which was the eventual state champion. And uh, so I, I was real proud of the, the boys we had at that time. And I had to drive, we played all our games away because we didn't have a gym, you know, nobody wanted to come play on an outdoor court. So uh, that, that year I drove the bus all that time. And Ange, Angie Hatcher uh, was a, a bus driver that lived near the old Gulf High School. And so they assigned me to use Angie's bus. And Angie was a no-nonsense person. She said, when you come get my bus, when you bring it back, I expect it to be gassed up and swept out. So when I bring the kids back, I drop them off at the old school. There was a gas pump right here on the corner. And uh, we, we would uh, put gas in, in, I'd sweep it out there. A lot of times Ken as a little kid was with me and he'd help me. And uh, I'd take her bus back, and she seemed to be happy. <laughs> so, 
So uh, the next year in basketball, uh, we played on the stage at the, at the Tarpon Springs Middle School. It was a big stage and it wasn't really adequate, but that they may do with that. That's where I played the games. And then Tarpon Springs High School built uh, a new uh, gymnasium and it was very nice. So that's Sims Park. That's where the yeah. mullet were. And there's Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's uh, Sims Park where they used to have bleachers there and they tore them down. And that's part of the 1960s golf team. I wasn't ball there. That was when they had the coop. <laughs> they just took your hair right down to, to make it square on top. And that's another part of it. And uh, the third year, you know, since Tarpon Springs had this nice, beautiful gym, I went down to see the principal. His name was Gene Chiswick. And uh, he was really a fine man. In fact, uh, I had uh, Pete Little and Dennis Pauline on that team. And they were really good shooters from the outside. And uh, Mr. Chiswick, uh, that's his son there, uh, he used to come and sit and watch us play, and we'd practice at night. And I'd put eight or nine kids in an old Chevrolet to take them down from Newport Ritchie to Tartan <laughs> Springs to practice. I, I tell you, it wasn't the good old days necessarily, yeah. <laughs> but it was in another sense. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Chiswick uh, said we could, he, he agreed we could use their gym, and that's what we did late at night. And uh, his son, Gene Chiswick Jr., you may see him on football talk shows and things. He was the head coach at Auburn. And I guess, what, you know, in college, if you don't win them all, or most of them, uh, they change coaches. But he's a sports commentator now, on one, one, I, I think on uh, CNN, or one, not CNN, but ESPN. And this was, uh, that was the 63 conference champion team. And that's Mike and the trophy. This was uh, Rudy Snyder. And Rudy Snyder was, I'll tell you, there wasn't a person that was more supportive of, of the schools in this area than Rudy. And the football field wasn't all that much. And I, I'm taking a long time, so I'll, I'll skip over some of it. But Rudy was instrumental in building the concrete bleachings behind the school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, the, the money was raised. That's Thad Lowry with him, who was the uh, head of uh, WGUL radio at the time. And, and of course, his advertising uh, helped uh, give support uh, to, to that uh, stadium. And uh, we also, at, at the first when uh, there, there, there had been some old buildings down by the river at the north end of the field, and we tried to fix them up. Rudy and, and the boosters tried to fix them up, but they still weren't adequate. And uh, we eventually, that's when he went to work on getting the dressing rooms under the stadium behind this school. But I remember when we had this old group, we were playing the East Bay High School in football, and I was the coach. And we gave them the best dressing room of the two. And I was frankly embarrassed by them. And these kids from East, and you could hear right through the wall. Mm -hmm. And so when those boys from East Bay walked in there to put their football uniforms on, I heard one of them say through the wall, watch out for the scorpions, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so. that, that was the, the, what the boosters built. And that, those were the old buildings down by the river that we... Yeah managed to fix up enough to use. And that this, uh, you see these helmets, they all look alike and everything. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't given much money to uh, outfit a team. So I looked and the equipment room was in the old golf high school. When you go up the steps, they, it was back in that straight, straight ahead room. And uh, I, I got back up there and looked at that, and we had gray helmets and white helmets and different green colored helmets and everything, and I thought, this can't do. Well, there was a fellow had a 
paint and body shop <laughs> at, at, at the end of uh, Gulf Drive, mm -hmm. where it comes in in 19. It was yeah. right there on the right. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Bill Larabelle. And, and uh, I, I went over to see Bill, and I said, and his son, it helped because his son was a, a team manager. And I said, Bill, can you paint all these helmets one color and make them look good? And some of them didn't have face masks on them, so we had to put uh, face masks. And the, and the kids, the football players, helped me screw those uh, uh, face, face masks on, on the helmets. But that, that's how we come to get this. And I found a, a company that had good equipment that was cheap, and it was New York Athletic Supply. I always remember that name, and I bought most of the equipment uh, uh, from, from New York Athletic Supply. And <clears throat> these were the coaches, uh, Bill Foster and J.C. Aikens. Uh, J.C. was from North Carolina, and he was kind of, Billy uh, Phillips noted that he was... He, 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 was a, he was a classic. He was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> well, there were, there, were two, there were two twin uh, fellows. They were older, two brothers. And they would always come, anytime golf had a uh, sporting event, they were there, you know. And I remember... J.C. had retired from coaching and he was sitting up in the stands and these two brothers were in the road in front of him. And one of them turned around and they were plumbers. Their business, they had a plumbing business in Newport Ritchie. And uh, one of them turned around to J.C. and said, uh, can I borrow your pen or pencil? And J.C. fell his pocket and he said, I don't, I don't have one. They said, what's the matter with you? You're a school teacher and you don't have a pencil with you? <laughs> he said, you got a wrench on you, fella? <laughs> <laughs> this is a golf high that was built on uh, Louisiana Avenue. And uh, I, I worked there for a number of years. And, and as the community grew, uh, the school system naturally had to grow. Only we didn't have, the school system didn't have the money to keep up with growth. So we ended up <clears throat> going on double sessions on the school. And then uh, uh, Roscoe Durden was the principal and I was assistant. And uh, at, at that time, when we went on double sessions, uh, they didn't, I, I had the afternoon session. He came in about 7.30 and went to 12 for the high school kids, 10 through 12. And then I had the junior high kids from 12.30 to 5 o'clock. And and the superintendent was pretty tight, so he didn't make me principal so I'd get there and pay, but I had the duties of a principal without being one. And the problem with that was that when there were discipline problems in the morning, Mr. Durden didn't take care of them. He put them on my desk. So when I would come in, I, you know, I was supposed to come in uh, five hours earlier uh, than, than the... Uh, five hours later rather than when they came in. And I'd see all these discipline slips on my desk. And so I was coming in earlier and earlier and pretty soon, you know, I was working too hard and, and uh, I didn't really have much choice there. And uh, from the kids in Newport Ritchie, I, I became famous. We had corporal punishment. State law still says that uh, school districts can use corporal punishment if they choose. But practically every district in Florida has stopped that practice. And uh, you, at, at the time, if you paddled somebody, you had to have a regulation paddle and you had to have a witness. And that was to protect you as much as it was the kid. Well, what happened to me, you know, I'd sign a kid in detention, a bunch of detentions. They wouldn't serve the detention. So I found myself in a, in a paper maze. You know, I, I would have to find out who came, who didn't come, and then call them back in, and it was, I was overwhelmed. So my answer was the paddle. <laughs> and, and I'd say, when they'd come in, I'd say, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> and I'd, I'd have them stand facing the wall, you know, with their hands up, and uh, I'd give them three whacks. So, uh, and, and then later we built uh, uh, Gulf, Gulf High School. We also uh, went on uh, uh, a year-round school. That was the new gym we had. 
And there's Jerry and again, Jerry Dodd. Jerry was a very good basketball player. And that, that's uh, Roscoe Durden there, and that was a, a coaching staff. And in the summer, uh, back then they only paid school teachers for, for nine months. Now, they may be getting uh, 180 days plus 16, that's usually what the planning days were. And, uh, but they spread the school board, if, if, if a teacher desired, they would spread the pay over 12 months so you had an income. Well, when I was there, they didn't do that. So I had to find, I, I, I had a family and I had to find some income for the summer. So uh, I taught swimming. At the first we, and again, I drove a school bus to Wikiwatchee Springs when we started. And that always concerned me about keeping up with the kids there, especially our kids, because Hernando County brought buses over there too. And the kids were intermingled. And I was always worried about the spring and the river. In fact, one time I had a mother come up there and picked up a kid and didn't tell me. And we were dragging the river looking for that kid. And I, was, and I never let that kid come back. <laughs> so. Then uh, uh, Grove Park uh, developed uh, down along 19, south, south of the uh, uh, Southgate Shopping Center there. And uh, this was the Grove Park pool. And, and the fellow that developed that, his name was Jack Green. So I went to see Jack and I said, you know, we have all these kids that need to learn how to swim. And could we use the Grove Park pool? And uh, so he, he finally consented, and we had the kids come. We charged him a quarter, <laughs> and we gave the money to Jack Green as if he needed it. But uh, it, was, <laughs> it was nice of him to do that. And, and we worked there as, as bodyguards. <laughs> and Jim Valentine, I told you, who uh, was there as the county athletic director, he was a big guy, and he was dark complected, and, and he had eaten a lot, and he had a big stomach, you know. And those those kids were there, and I'd be in a chair on the other side of the pool from him, and I'd say, "You see that guy over there? Hawaii Vivo was very popular at the time." And I said, "That's a big Kahuna." <laughs> so they'd go over there and ask him, you know, and he'd just win, and he'd say, "Go back and tell Tom Waitman I want to." Uh, uh, do, do I have change for a six dollar bill? And I said, <laughs> I said we, we, we played those kids. You know, we, we, we had, we, the point is, we had a good time. And this was uh, Connie uh, goes to the year-round school program. The 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 forty-five. It was forty-five fifteen. The kids would go to school uh, for forty-five days, and they'd be off fifteen days. And that way you had school building utilization for the whole year. And it was wonderful for the people on the west side of the county because it was a necessity and they accepted it. But in East Pasco, it didn't grow like West Pasco. And they had enough room for the kids in, to yeah. go to school. But the problem was the school board decided that if the west side of the county had to do it, the east side did too. So consequently, there was there was a lot of dissatisfaction with 45-15, but it but it actually uh, helped. It, but even then, we didn't keep up with with all the growth. And this this is uh, Cypress uh, Cypress Elementary. I uh, getting to be uh, well. Let, let me tell you, Rodney Cox was. Uh, the first re Republican elected uh, to a, a countywide position in Pasco County. And uh, Ronnie asked me, to, he didn't advertise position for uh, assistant for instruction or for administration. And Mary Giella, who was a very fine person, was his assistant for uh, instruction and, he, and I was his assistant for administration. And. Rodney, he, he, during his campaign, he, he, he was ill, and then uh, he went, to, he actually attended one school board meeting, and they discovered that he had colon cancer. So he went to uh, Lakeland General Hospital, and the school board appointed me interim superintendent. And so I served for a number of months, <clears throat> and the office was in Dade City at that time. I lived in Newport, Richie. So I drive to Dade City to work, 
and he wanted he thought he would get better and, and so he wanted to know everything that happened in schools so I drive after work in Bay City to, to Lakeland he was in Lakeland general and then I drive I four back to Newport Ritchie after I and then I do the same thing the next day and it, it about warm, warm me out but uh, I survived it and anyway Rodney passed away and the governor of Florida at the time was uh, uh, Reuben Askew well, Reuben Askew, you know, 67 counties in Florida, and Reuben Askew had what he called a patronage committee uh, in each county, composed of political supporters. And uh, in Pasco County, there were seven people on the patronage committee. Five of them lived in Dade City, two lived in Newport Ritchie. Tommy Thomas was one of those in, in uh, west side of the county. Anyway, uh, to fill, to fill a term where an elected person dies, uh, the governor makes the appointment until the next general election. So in, in that case, uh, he asked his patrons committee who, who he should select uh, to be school, superintendent of schools for a two-year term. And uh, it was really a little less than a two-year term. So uh, Ray Stewart was the principal of Zephyr Hills High School at the time. And Ray got five votes, and I got two votes. Guess where they were? <laughs> what yeah. side of the county? Yeah. So it was more of a decision based on county. So Ray asked me if, if I would stay as his assistant, but I declined. In Cypress Elementary School, principalship was open, so I went there mm -hmm. as principal. And uh, I stayed there uh, until the next general election. I told Ray I probably would run for the job. I was thinking about it. But what convinced me to do that was, at the time, uh, Harry Schwetman, uh, let's see if I have him here. Uh, this was during the election. <laughs> Pass on that real quick. Uh, and th that comes later. But uh, to tell you about uh, Harry, he and a neighbor of his that lived in Jasmine Lakes, uh, Jasmine Heights, I guess it is. Uh, they came to see me. I was in, in at home, and they came to see me and said, can we talk to you a little bit? And I said, yeah. They said, we would like for you to run for superintendent of schools. And uh, they said, but there's a condition. We want you to run as a Republican. I was, you know, when I first came to Florida, I registered as a Democrat, and there were no Republicans. If, if the only vote was in the Democratic primary, and if you were registered as a Republican, uh, you, you, you couldn't vote. So uh, they said, if you'll run as a Republican uh, and change parties, uh, we'll support you. And, and, and we can't guarantee that you won't have primary opposition, but we'll discourage it. So uh, I, I was still, uh, thinking about it at the time, and, and uh, Betty Cox's wife uh, called me and she said, Tom, Rodney would want you to run. So that, that kind of sensed it for me. So I ran for superintendent, and that was, in, uh, that was for a two-year term. And it was in 1974, and then I had to run again in, in 1976. But uh, uh, that, that was my start, and we... Uh, we campaigned from, from there. And um, so I, I won uh, the, the, uh, the race in 74. And uh, that, that, was, that was a trying time for me at the time because the uh, school boards in the state, uh, most of them had hand systems. But there was a fellow named Bill Taylor who worked in the State Department of Education who was good at the computer computer system and, uh, and, and putting data, oops, you all right, Bill? <laughs> put, uh, please stop me when, when I need to stop because I think we're going pretty long here. But anyway, uh, the, I was uh, put in office in November after the election. The, the uh, fiscal year for uh, school boards is in July. So we went, uh, so Bill Taylor got a contract from the school board to computerize the system. He stopped the hand system and he told uh, the, the board 
that uh, they would get uh, printouts. Well, he gave them printouts, but they weren't any good. So I was superintendent and, and didn't know how much money we had spent through the first four or five months of the year. I didn't know how much money we had. And Dr. Giella and I and uh, Marilyn Hall, the finance officer, and Chuck Brucey, uh, I hired Chuck from uh, Richie Mix Concrete Plant. He was their controller. And he was, he was ri ri they were both very good. But we would work till midnight, trying to straighten out the budget because to see how much money we had. So anyway, uh, uh, Ms. Hall told me, she said, if, if we continue to spend at the rate we are with what we've done since July, she said, we're going to be in a hole by 3%. So I, I uh, talked it over with my staff and I said, <clears throat> I'm going to ask the employees to take a 3% cut. And I'm going to tell them that I'll take a 3% cut too. And that's, that should make them know that it's okay because I'm willing to do it. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> the problem was that the year I got elected in 1974, the state of Florida passed the Public Employee Relations Act, which gave public employees the right to bargain collectively. And that established uh, a teachers union in each district in the state. And they were well-meaning and well-intentioned, but uh, I didn't know anything about collective bargaining or how to negotiate. But the superintendent before me, the year before, uh, Ray Stewart, the union leadership at the time said to him, why don't we get a head start, a head jump on it for a year? So when I came in in 74, there was already in place a, a uh, contract with the teachers union. And when I went to them and, and said, I need to cut your salaries 3% because we have this problem, they said, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> So they said, we, we have an agreement. There's another state law that says local uh, government entities cannot operate in the black. You must have a balanced budget. And I knew that if we continued on that scale, that we weren't going to have a balanced budget. So I had a choice between breaking a state law on uh, having a balanced budget or breaking a collective bargaining law by violating the contract. So uh, the, the governing body, the state governing body for that was uh, PERC, P-E-R-C, Public Employees Relations Commission. And the union could file grievances with them. So, uh, and the contract stated that in every school there had to be a bulletin board for the union. So, I told the union at the time, and, and they were good people. June Pearson was a local girl, <coughs> very, very bright and uh, everything, but she had a job to do uh, for the teachers, and I understood that. Another fellow was Jerry Morris. And, uh, but they were adamant that those salaries were not going to be cut. So. Uh, I en ended up saying I'm, I'm going to feel safer keeping the state law you know, saying you can't go on the red uh, to violating that contract. So I violated the contract and cut their salaries 3% and they appealed to PERC and PERC convicted me of an unfair labor practice and I had to write, I had to write an apology and place it to be placed on every bulletin board in the county. And <clears throat> I had my assistant, Dr. John Long, sign it. And <laughs> <laughs> so, but, and John Long, he was, he was a good, and Mary Jella was, it was fantastic. But John Long was, uh, uh, he, he loved a joke and everything, you know. Well, at the time we went on, in the summer, uh, We'd go Monday through Thursday, and to save electricity, we'd take Friday uh, off to have a long weekend. And, and to make up that time, we'd work, uh, said eight hour days, we'd work 10 hour days. So uh, I used to go over, when I could, I couldn't all the time, but when I could, I would go over to Pine Bees running track, and I'd change my clothes, I'd take my suit off in my office and put on running shoes and everything, and I'd uh, and then I'd go over to Pine View and run. So 
the first day of the late day, uh, the 10 hour day, I'm walking out, his office is up front of mine, and I'm walking out, he said, hey, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going over to Pine View and run. He said, it's a 10 hour day. And I say, oh, I better get, I, I forgot about that. So I, I came in and put my suit back on, or we was going to. But I, he said, well, come on in my office, I need to talk to you. We had a side door. And so I took my clothes off and I'm standing in front of the desk in my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jim Lowers, our, our director of uh, facilities, he had asked him to come in his side door. And Dr. Lowers comes in that side door and he gets it open about that far. <laughs> And he doesn't know whether to come in or go out, you know. <laughs> and John Long said to him, God knows, Lars, I bet you think you got a job for life. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, we had a good, a good time. And since Mike's here, I, 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 I had written a letter for Mike about uh, uh, the, the state transportation. He was our director of transportation when he worked in the school district. And uh, Mike, uh, Mike had been honored by the, uh, the uh, state school transportation directors. And uh, Bev asked me if I would write uh, uh, what, what he had done for the system. And he did a lot. And I got credit for a lot of what he did. We had to supply the money, but uh, he, he took charge of that. Anyway, uh, Mike had some... Uh, uh, prostate problems. I don't think he minds me telling that. I've had some prostate problems. And, and uh, any, anyway, uh, he, he uh, had to set up, part of his job was to set up bus stops around the county. Well, every parent wants a bus stop close to their home. And you can't, if, if you solve, if you did what everybody wanted you to do, uh, it'd take you forever to get to school. So you just had to set them up in certain, certain places. So uh, people would gripe and they would call me and I always supported Mike in, in that, but he, he had an assistant named Terry Rum. So anyway, Mike had to go to the doctor and, and it was a physician's assistant, had him up on the table, he said, curl your legs up under you. And he stood behind him and he was checking his prostate and he could see it on the screen up there. So Mike, Mike went all through that and he goes back to the bus garage and you know all these headaches he had. He said, hey Terry, I know a guy's got a worse job than we do. <laughs> I, I started to tell you that uh, you know, as the system grew, we grew, and I think in the in the years I was superintendent, we built approximately 20 new schools, yeah. and we we probably averaged one a year. But after I left, they were building three and four a year. So uh, it, 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 it's a big business, and I think probably school board is probably the largest employer in the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway. Uh, I'm going to leave out some things because it's, it's going long, but the last thing I want to mention is when I retired, uh, I thought I needed to give back to the community some way, so I, uh, they, they had an opening on the community college uh, board of trustees, and so that's a gubernatorial appointment. And uh, so uh, I think it was Jeff Bush that appointed me to that job. and. Uh, we, we, uh, I, uh, Bob, the, the college only had two presidents at that time. They, they had had Bob, they, they had Milt Jones, who was there forever, and then Bob Judson, uh, who came in. And having been a superintendent for all those years, I knew Bob was probably a little nervous about, there's, there's a, a school board has a job to do, and the superintendent has a job to do, and, and they shouldn't mix and so I went to see Bob Judson and I, I was appointed uh, to the position in 2003 and I went to see Bob Judson and I told him I said look I'm, I'm not going to get uh, into administration I won't get in conflict with you and I'll be supportive of, of the good decisions that you make so that's what we did and during that time we built uh, we, we, we put additions on the existing campuses there were three it was one in Dade City, one in Newport Ritchie, and one in Brooksville. And uh, 
the Pasco, there are 28 community colleges in the state of Florida. And the very last one to establish a community college was Pasco County. And the reason was they could not agree on, everyone wanted it. Newport Ritchie wanted it, Dade City wanted it, Brooksville wanted it. So they finally uh, came about a compromise and had a branch campus in each of those. So we had three, uh, three uh, college campuses, and Newport Ritchie was the largest because most of the kids were here, yeah. students were here. So uh, I was on from 2003 to 2011, and I chose to leave at that time. I could have been reappointed, but uh, I thought, you know, I'm getting older and I don't know how much time I have played golf yet. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, while I was there, we built two campuses. We built uh, a, a beautiful campus in Spring Hill mm -hmm. and a beautiful campus at Wiregrass Ranch. And uh, so uh, I can say that all, all the years uh, that I was in education was totally about 45 years uh, between being a teacher and an assistant principal and a principal and a dean and a student council sponsor and all this thing. I enjoyed them all. And I'm not saying that there weren't tough times in there along the way, but uh, I worked with some wonderful people and had wonderful kids uh, to work with. And uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And I, I appreciate your attention. I hope I haven't bored you too much. No. <laughs> Anyone have any questions or comments? Oh, when you first came to Florida and your dad had the gas station and you came from Pensy, how did how was the climate change? You were just a kid, I mean, and it didn't look like you guys had much air conditioning. Well, we didn't. So, Schools didn't have much air conditioning. <laughs> in fact, I can remember in uh, in uh, in fact, they named Day City Grammar, which was up here. At the superintendent that I succeeded. Uh, in after elections, Rodney Cox. They, named, they renamed that school Rodney Cox Elementary. But the, there was no air conditioning. The windows were open, and there were orange groves all over the place. And, and there were these gnats that were attracted. And I can remember kids in school, you know, having pink eye and pussy eyes and gnats around their eyes. And, and, and then when I became superintendent, if the air conditioner was out a couple of days, I cut all kind of heck from the parents. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. My dad rented the house while he was building the house, and uh, I had I had uh, this was on Pasco Avenue in Dade City, and it was a rental house, and I had never seen uh, Florida roads before. <laughs> and, and I remember I was about I was about eleven or twelve, and and uh, my mother had made the bed during the day, and she turned the light on, and I pulled down the sheet. And it must have been, I don't know oh, how many of you were oh. And I, I was afraid to turn the light out. <laughs> so, thank you. I enjoyed being here. So little compared to what you gave us today, but we have a little gift for you and your wife, and we just thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like everybody to raise their hand that was in school when I call him Coach Waitman because my age group is how we knew him when he was a coach or a teacher or whatever. I think there's lots here today that are alumni yeah. that knew. You were my superintendent. Yeah. 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 You, were you were the best course. superintendent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, it was my um, kids that were in school, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember the paddlings. Thank goodness I wasn't involved in that. <laughs> but I just remember him as such a kind and gentle man. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.